Brother Lucas, I saw you driving a car down the road. But you were driving the car looking in a rear view mirror, not looking out of the windshield. He said, stop doing that. There's more ahead of you than is behind you. And he's going to take you where you need to go because his call is upon your life. You can't run from it. You can't lay it down. You can't get away from it. It's on you. God's not going to let go of you. You can't run from him. You can't hide from him. He sees you. And he's going to take you where you need to go because his hand is upon you. Amen. 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 Okay. I love testimonies. Well, first of all, I got a text yesterday from Pastor Caleb. We're down at the river watching the ducks. And I got a text that said, I got family issues I got to deal with, not marriage issues. <laughs> I got a sick child I got to stay home with. Can you share today? And it just so happened I had read 1 Corinthians chapter 14 about three days ago. It says, when you all come together, one has a song, one has a revelation, one has a teaching. So I said, I, well, I guess I'm it. <laughs> so I woke up this morning with a song on my heart by Toby Keith. It's not too spiritual. Anyway. But I am going to change one word. I love this church. You know his, what his song says. It's my kind of place. So I'm so excited that we can have, we're changing things around. That's what happens when you have young pastors. They like to change things up. So anyway, um, I love testimonies. I told Susan, I'm going to have to call somebody up to give a testimony today. But Pastor Taylor already did that. But I got another one. There's prayer cards in the back. And somebody gave me this before the service. It's been up there for a year. A year. She took it down because guess what? Prayer for Mike and Andre. Connie Elson's brother has lung cancer. He don't have lung cancer anymore. Yeah. What the doctors say Kathy Payton has, she doesn't have that anymore. It's gone in Jesus' name. I love testimonies. So I didn't have time to write a whole lot of scriptures down. <laughs> You'd be glad about that. So I was going to share from my heart. Um, I was raised in a denomination where the messages were 30 minutes. Then I became uh, part of a charismatic church where the messages were 90 minutes. Remember those days? They had 90-minute cassette tapes to make sure they got the whole message on. So anyway, we're going to strive for a happy medium today. So, um, I just want to say one more thing about the prophetic. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets uh, sp spoke to the people for God. Pastor Taylor and I just did a whole series of meetings with Brandon Gaston, who will be here in May, on the New Covenant Prophets. So New Covenant Prophecy is for us to hear God with you, not for you. Amen. There's a difference. New Testament Prophecy is to hear God with you. That's what we're doing up here, not for you. That's a, that's, we're not priests. We're a kingdom of priests, but we don't go to a priest Amen. to get revelation. So anyway, um, I wanted to share a scripture and a word of encouragement for somebody who needs some encouragement. I'm kidding, Kim. <laughs> she encourages, she's laughing right now. <laughs> but I'm doing this to just kind of show you how prophetic works. So the Lord gave me this scripture, we've, we've heard it before, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 9. 
It says, eyes not seen or ear heard, enter in the heart of man, things God has prepared for those who love him. Now, this is what the Lord showed me. So, I got a sports background and a teaching background. So, the Holy Spirit speaks to me in those areas to get spiritual insight. So, he showed me playing a softball game. All right, now, I was on the church league when I was growing up. There's two kinds of softball. There's slow pitch and there's fast pitch. So you just been doing slow pitch. Oh boy. God says he's gonna put you in a fast pitch game where you're gonna have to raise your level. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. But verse 10 says, these things are revealed to us by his spirit. So don't, don't ever ask somebody that's prophesying to you, what does that mean? Don't ask him that. Because you'll know what it means when you need to know it. So he's saying raise your level. Well, that can mean a lot of things. Raise your level of intimacy. Raise your level of knowledge. Raise the level of opportunity. But you'll know what that means when you need to know it. So that's how prophecy works. When you need to know, have insight and revelation, you'll know it when you need to. Okay, now I'm, I'll, I'll share a word I got. I turned 70 in February, and I thought, well, it's time for me to start slowing down, taking it easy, you know, uh, not do some, try not to do so much, not be involved in so much things. So I was kind of resigned myself to that. But we went to these meetings I was talking about, and this woman that I'd never met gave me this word. She said, 1 Timothy 4.12. It says, that verse tells Timothy uh, not to despise your youth. Well, she said just the opposite in my case. Don't despise your experience. That's a polite word. But he said, he said there's something specific in this season ahead. You are secure in your identity, and this will allow you to step into something that wasn't possible in a previous season. It's the culmination of wisdom and age. Well, that, that lit a fire under me. So God's not done with me. We went uh, last year, about a year ago, we went to a prophetic meeting in Evangel, me and Rodney Redden, and Kent Christmas was speaking. You might know that name, Kent Christmas. Very powerful. Well, before he spoke, the, the pastor um, said, everybody under 30, come down front. So all the young people came down front and he said, all you, he didn't say old people, all, all you others, stretch forth your hands and pray a blessing on these young people. And young people need to be encouraged. There's no doubt about that. They do. But I was thinking, well, what about the rest of us? We need to be encouraged too. So uh, the next thing he did, he said, now all you young people turn around and pray a blessing on the others. So the young got encouraged. The old, the old eld, not elder, the old got encouraged. So God wants to encourage all of us. So I I'm, I'm hope I'm doing that today. So I'm going to read... I'm going to call this message links in a chain, okay? We're all part of a chain, okay? We've got a natural chain and our spiritual chain. So I just recently met my second cousin once removed. I can't explain that. That's just that it is. Second cousin. <laughs> His great-grandfather was my great-great-grandfather. So anyway, something like that. So anyway, but um, the way he got in touch with me, lived in Cincinnati, and I'm telling this story for a reason, because God is always working where we can't see him working in our lives. We don't know it, but he's working. So he said, I met with him, took him some information about the family. So he said, this is how I got in touch with you. I went to a anniversary celebration of a magazine 
or a group, magazine group we're a member of. So we were invited to a, to a celebration in Lexington, Kentucky. When we got there, there was no place to sit. So there was one table left. So we went over and sat down by this man and his name was, um, not that it matters, Dwight Thompson. So he introduced himself. Hello, I'm Paul Calico. So he said, now I can remember that name because I'm from Mount Sterling and I used to be a customer at Calico and Witt, which was my dad's store. And my cousin said, wow, do you know how I get in touch with him? He said, I can't put you in touch with him, but one of my best friends in Mount Sterling is a, a man I went to school with who actually bought the store from my dad. He said, I'll get in touch with him, he'll get in touch with you, and you can get in touch with George. So that's how we got together. You know, we attribute stuff to being a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences. I hate coincidences. But God is always working. Now, here's a, here's a chain of people in the Bible. It says, the title of this, Do You Seriously Think God Can't Use You? You know, Paul said that we all can do what? We all can prophesy. That's the only gift that said that about. We all can prophesy. And over the next several weeks, you're going to see a various group of people up here ministering, young, old, so forth, because we all can minister, we all can prophesy. So here's some people in the Bible. And, and I share this at the jail. Rob's heard this before, Michael. Because this shows how God can take a weak vessel, a flawed vessel, which we are, all are, and use this to his glory. So Noah was a drunk. Abraham was old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. I don't know how this got in here. Leah was ugly. So I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think that applies to anybody in here, but I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. Moses stuttered. Gideon was afraid. Uh, Rahab was a prostitute. Jonah ran from God. Peter denied Christ. Um, Zacchaeus was short. And my favorite one, Lazarus was dead. He even uses dead people which is supposed to be us, we're supposed to be dead, right? Our life is hidden Christ with God. We're dead. So if you want to be used by God, reckon yourself dead. Reckon yourself dead. So anyway, I want to, uh, I gave Aaron a bunch of scriptures, which we're not going to need. So, <laughs> I am too much fun. <laughs> so, one of my favorite scriptures, I know many of you all, is Jeremiah 29, 11, right? Yeah. Know the plans I have for you, give you future and hope, not for good, evil, give you future and hope, and so forth. So, but sometimes we don't realize the context of that scripture. That scripture was written to the captivities in Babylon. That, that scripture was written through the prophet to a people in captivity. Now, we could all be in captivity in different ways, okay? We can be captive in our minds, in our bodies, in our thinking, in, in various different ways. But that scripture, verse 10, says, Seek him while he may be found. All right? So God's got a part, and we've got a part. We can't do his part, and he won't do our part. Say that again. We can't do God's part, and He won't do our part. So we got to figure out what God wants us to do and be faithful to do it. Now, Susan and I, we like to travel. Uh, she taught 40 years, I taught 31 years. So when it comes to March, we, it's time for spring break. She hadn't worked in two years, and I hadn't worked in about eight years. But it's still spring break, so we're going to go. <laughs> okay. Um, so we went 
um, several different places in the south. So whenever I travel, I take a scripture. This is an icebreaker. It's really not important what the scripture says. It says, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth, Psalm 121, 12. But I'll give that to somebody and see if it breaks the ice. Some people say, I'm good. And I say, yeah, you're doing better than I am. And then some people say, thank you very much. And some people say, I appreciate this encouragement. So we were at, at, one of the, at a motel, and um, I gave that to the guy at the desk. I noticed he had an accent, young black guy. I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from this country in Africa. I said, oh, I've been to Africa. It's good to, good to, good to meet you. So I went upstairs, and the Lord said, go back down there, share this scripture. Aaron, put that up, Ephesians 2.10. Share this scripture with him and encourage him. I said, okay. So I, this used to be on a picture out in the hall. We are his workmanship, and that word workmanship is actually the word that we get poetry from. Some translations say we are his masterpiece. Creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared before that we should walk in him. And I said, I think God has something for you to do in ministry. I said, I see you standing before groups of people sharing about the love of Christ. And he looked at me and said, that's the desire of my heart to do that. I said, that's wonderful. So went back upstairs. There's a barbecue place across the, from the hotel. So I went over to this barbecue place and a young lady um, took my order. And I saw an older gentleman back cooking back in the kitchen. I said, who's that man in the kitchen? She said, that's my dad. He's from Nigeria. I said, bring him out here. <laughs> so I said, you're from Nigeria? He said, yeah. I said, well, I've been to Ghana. Me and Carol went about seven years ago, and, uh, which is right next to Nigeria. I said, I think the, the, the Lord has a word for you. He said, really? I said, yeah, he does. So I shared what God, well, first thing I said, God has you here not just as a businessman, but as a light. When I said that, it went like this. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I said, we're having church, aren't we? He said, yes, we're having church. And I said, he's gonna prosper your business. You're gonna have influence and impact on people's lives that come in here. I said, God just wants to encourage you that you're at the right place where he wants you to be. He said, hallelujah. And then I went back to the hotel and I said, I just met a man from Nigeria and told him that God had a, uh, had a purpose for him in his business. He said, oh, I know that guy. We go to church together. <laughs> so I said, tell me that's a coincidence. Just tell me. I dare you. But anyway. Um, now, Ken Montgomery has spent some time in Africa. When I was at, when I was at youth camp as a teenager, I was, I was a Christian, I was in high school. I said, God, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll even go to Africa. And 50 years later, I went to Africa. I waited a long time. <laughs> but we all can't go to Africa, but sometimes God will bring Africa to us. And I don't mean real Africans, although that's kind of cool that that happened. But God will bring people to us if we're open to share what God puts on our heart because we're just a link in a chain, a link in a chain. Now, also on this list is Gideon. It says Gideon was afraid. We all know the story of Gideon where he was minding, he was minding his own business, doing his job on the farm, and he got a visitation by an angel. And the angel said, Greetings, mighty men of valor. I felt like that when I got that text from Pastor Caleb. I started saying, who is this? 
is this real or is this really you? So the angel said, um, God is with you and is going to use you to defeat the Midianites. And he kept making excuse after excuse after excuse. So finally, Gideon said, okay, I see what you're saying, but I want to ask you for a sign. Remember the, the fleece? Ask, ask him for two signs. So we don't do that anymore because we don't need a sign because we have the Holy Spirit. But Mark 16 says, God confirms his word with what? Signs. So I'm going to pray for a sign. It's okay. I'm going to pray for a sign. Um, it has to do with finances. I, I, really, I love praying for finances. So, Lord said, pray for raises, promotion, and favor. Anybody like to have some of that? Raise, promotion, and favor. Okay. It should be 100% of you. <laughs> Even if you're retired, you get a Social Security raise, right? Yeah. So, you know, when people prophesy, they don't, don't like to put... Uh, a time constraint on when things are going to happen because God doesn't work in our time. One year, healed the cancer, one year. But I'd hate to wait a year for a raise. So I'm just going to declare over this church and also not just individually, but also for corporately. Yeah. Corporately. Um, and that, that word I had for Lucas is also for this church. There's more ahead of us than what's behind us. There's more ahead of us, this church, than what's behind us. But we need to have finances. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, if you want some of this, raise your hand. God, we're praying for signs to confirm your word. And, Father, we're praying for workplace favor. Workplace favor... I pray for all those that are being hindered by work, workship relationships, Father God, that you pour out your favor, whether it's employee, employer, employee, employee, whatever it is, Father God, I'm praying for your favor to be poured out on those situations. I'm praying for promotions. I'm praying for promotions for men and women to be raised up in the workplace with insight and wisdom and with confidence, whatever they need, Father God, to fulfill the need of that workplace. And Father, I'm also praying for raises. Father God, I'm praying for unexpected raises. The boss is gonna call, call us in and say, guess what? I don't know why I'm doing this. I love to hear that. I don't know why I'm doing this, but you're getting a raise. So I'm declaring that today Raises promotion and favor on the people of God in Jesus' name. So when that happens, let me know. Let me know. So um, I guess I'm going to wind up here. Um, I did have a lot of notes and stuff, but oh, I'm going to share this one thing. There's a hey, that little book over there. One of my wife's students gave me this book called The Butterfly Effect. But this talks about everything we do has consequences. We have no idea who am I affecting. How significant is my life? Do I make a difference? When I move, when I act, when I do something, does anyone notice, do I matter? 1963, Edward Lorenz presented a hypothesis to the Academy of Science. His theory was a butterfly now, who's heard of this, Butterfly Effect? Anybody? There's actually a movie about it. It's a weird movie, but anyway, it's a movie. A butterfly, could, a butterfly could flap its wings and set molecules of air in motion, which move other molecules of air, move molecules of air, eventually capable of starting a hurricane. It was preposterous but fascinating. Because of the idea's charm and intrigue, the Butterfly Effect became a staple of science fiction. That's the movie I was talking about. So imagine the scientific community's shock and surprise 
When more than 30 years after the possibility was introduced, a physics professor who worked from colleges came to the conclusion that the butterfly effect was authentic, accurate, and viable. This actually has a name. I'm sure you're going to remember this. The law of sensitive dependence upon initial conditions. That's what it's called. So the point of all that is we never know who we're going to affect, whose lives we're going to touch, we just minister to one person. You know, we know that Joel Osteen's on tea, but it, before that I used to watch his dad, John Osteen. John Osteen was, uh, lived on a farm, not near a church, but he had a friend who was always after him to go to church. And eventually he gave in to his friend. He went to church with his friend. He got saved. He said, people got saved last week. Who are they going to affect? Whose lives are they going to touch? Hundreds and thousands. And so John gave his life to the Lord, became a minister, did mission work, started a church, and has affected thousands, tens of thousands of people because one boy invited him to church. So I'm going to close with a story it's in one of my devotional books. It's called Links in a Chain. This is about Edward Kimball. You may have heard that name. Because that's my wife. <laughs> he was a Sunday school teacher. But he had a boy in his Sunday school class. Now, this is for the, especially to the youth ministers and children's ministers. He had a boy in his class named Dwight Moody. I know you've heard of that name. He worked in a shoe store. So Dwight, Edward Campbell went down to witness to Dwight and share the love of Christ. So Moody got saved, became an evangelist. He went to England, had a series of crusades, and a, young, a man there in his crusade named F.B. Meyer got saved. So Moody invited Meyer to tour America with him. Um, he said, if you're not willing to give up everything for Christ, are you willing to be made willing? I like that. Are you willing to be made willing? The mark changed the life of a young minister named Wilbur Chapman. Chapman proceeded to become a powerful traveling evangelist in the early 1900s. He recruited a converted ball player named Billy Sunday. Yes. Now, Billy Sunday um, was a professional baseball player who gave his life to the Lord and had a great testimony. Now, let me interject here. We, we think to have a great testimony, we have to talk about all the bad things we did, we've done. But you don't need to do bad things to have a good testimony. You don't need to have done bad things to have a good testimony. I think about Andrew Walmack. He said, I've never smoked a cigarette took a drink of liquor, said a curse word. Now, how many people can say that? All three of those. Probably nobody. But that's a testimony. And the greatest testimony by the one that led a sinless life, our Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Susan was telling me yesterday, she had friends in college. They were good Christian girls. And they said, I don't have a testimony. I've been good my whole life. Man, that is sad. That's a powerful testimony. God changed my life. I've led a good Christian life. Now, I'll just say this. I was raised by a Baptist deacon. And a, a Christian woman. There was never a curse word said in our house. I raised my son the same way. My son never heard a curse word from me. And his children will never hear a curse word from him. So we're, it's just a small way of how we can have an influence. Because the people we need to influence most are our children. The people we need to influence the most. Train up a child, right? And that actually means to train a child the way he is bent. My, my, Susan has five kids. They're all bent different. 
I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that to them. But <laughs> they're all bent different. So I only got one son, so I know how he's been. But she had to raise five kids part of the time by herself. But they all turned out very successful, if you all know them very well. Because she trained them up in the way they're supposed to be meant. Now, I'm going to tell one story about one of her kids. They were in a car, and she said, I'm going to pray that if you don't get straightened out, this may be a little bit not exactly right. God's going to do something. Is that how it went? Sort of. All right. If you don't straighten, if you don't straighten it out, I'm going to tell, ask God to straighten you out. Maybe I'll say it like that. Although it was a little more, a little more harsh than that. But anyway, he should have died in a ditch. He should have died in a ditch while drinking and driving. He should be dead. But he's not. He's alive. And he's serving the Lord. And he's got a family. So anyway, let me finish this story and we'll be done. All right. All right, that remark changed the life of a struggling young minister named J. Wilbur Chapman. Chapman proceeded to become a powerful traveling evangelist, early 1900, old Billy Sunday. Okay, in, in a campaign in Charlotte, North Carolina, produced a group of converts. In 1934, this group invited evangelist Mordecai Ham to conduct a citywide crusade. On October 8th, Ham wrote a, was very discouraged. He wrote, he wrote this prayer. Lord, give us a Pentecost, pour out your Holy Spirit. His prayer was answered beyond his dreams. When a Central High School student named Billy Graham gave his heart to Jesus, all because Edward Kimball was a link in the chain. That's, isn't that cool? I love that story. So, we're just a link. I can see how God has worked in my life to bring me to this point. And you have that Ephesians 1.11 up there? We'll end with that. Uh, sometimes we can't see the forest or the trees. We can't see what God's doing in our lives because we're looking at the situation. Now, Kelly had a word. The last thing she said was it look to the Lord, something like that. You said look. Look at look to him. So like I said, God speaks to me in uh, sports areas. So I woke up last night thinking about the Olympics. I, my son and I went to the 96 Olympics in Atlanta, which was a great experience. But in the Olympics, one of the most popular sports is women's gymnastics. And part of the gymnastics is the balance beam. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We had a balance beam in our school. And the balance beam is four inches wide. Four inches. And they do flips and handstands, all kinds of stuff. But how do you get from one end of the balance? I looked this up when I woke up. How do you get from one end of the balance to the other end of the balance beam? You don't look at your feet. It says you keep your eyes up and you look to where you're going. So we don't look at our mess. We look where God's taking us. So that's, that's the word for everybody. Don't look at where you've messed up. Don't look what you're going through right now. Look up. Hebrews 12, 2. Look unto Jesus. He's the author and he's also the what? The finisher. One of my favorite movies, The Finisher. He's the author and finisher, but we have to keep our eyes on him. He sees what we're going through. He feels what we're going through. He knows what we're going through. And he's got it. He's got us. You would just keep looking to him, moving forward, and you're going to reach your destination. Amen. I'm done.